I don't ever remember not playing. The first drum I saw was a red parade drum. My uncle was a veteran and he was marching in a Memorial Day parade. So he gave me a pair of sticks, showed me how to hold them. We'd listen to John Philip Sousa marches on the record player. And he, he and I would, you know, play at the same time. I'd try to emulate what he was doing. And, um, and the whole family would sit around because this was before TV. My dad and my mom worked, so uh, I would go out to the barn with my grandmother and, um, you know, we'd take care of the horses. And then I'd come back and uh, I would put my uncle's cowboy boots on and go stand by the uh, record player and play music. And I loved the way that the, the, it sounded when I tapped my foot with his boots on. I, I forgot about that, but I remember that. A friend of my uncle's had a little snare drum, and uh, someone that my, my uncle used to ride with. And uh, he gave me a snare drum when I was still, before I was three. And um, they used to keep it behind the couch, and everyone, they'd let me play it on special occasions, but they'd have to put like a piece of cloth over it so it wasn't too loud. I kept on practicing and they, I kept on showing an interest in playing. So like maybe on a birthday, they would give me a bass drum and a, and a regular snare drum that went with the bass drum. You know, a regular, this first snare drum was a little. So I had a bass drum and a snare. And then for Christmas, they'd give me a hi-hat, right? And for another holiday, they'd give me a tom. Got to practice. You know, I put the set together probably over a few years. And what I did was I just sort of got used to playing the bass drum with the snare drum for a while. And then my uncle told me, you know, that you play the hi-hat on two and four, so I tried to do that. I won a trip to Hollywood and appeared on the Mickey Mouse Club. Fridays were talent roundup day, that's what they called them. When the show wasn't on the air, they, they would go to different cities in the United States and check out talent. And if you, you know, if, if you were chosen, They'd give you a free trip to Disneyland. And so when I was on the show, I played my first little, uh, I, I had took my own drums out there, my little put together kit. There used to be a, a place called the Ridgecrest Inn in Rochester. And they brought in um, a lot of the, the artists that, <clears throat> that were records that my uncle had given me. You know, Art Blakey, Max Roach. I mean, I could sit as close as I am to you and watch these, watch these guys play. And, uh, and on Sunday afternoons, there were matinees, and um, they, would, uh, they were kind enough to let, let us sit in. Well, you know, so we got to sit in with Dizzy. And my family would be there, my mom and dad, my brother, and uh, my grandparents and uncle would, would be there. And also Chuck Mangione's family would be there. One time, I, you know, Gene Group, I took my little set of drums in there, and Gene was playing on my little set of drums while my brother and I were tap dancing with... with uh, so, I mean, it was just, uh, it was a great... Well, they were great times. During high school, I started playing um, six, six nights a week um, with, uh, with Chucky and Gap and Joe Romano and Frank Polero at, at, at this club. It was time to go to college, and I, would, I actually would have preferred to keep working six nights a week. But Vietnam was, was happening then, and if I didn't, if I wasn't in school, I'd, go to, I'd have to go to, you know, I'd have to go fight, and I didn't, you know, I didn't want to do that, so. Chuck Mangione had, was playing with Art Blakey, and Chick Corea was in the band, and they had left the band. So, I, they, he put a band together with Chick Corea, and we started working six nights a week in Rochester. It was basically the same band that I did when I was in high school, only out, now I'm in college, and now it's with Chick Corea. And I, um, was listening a lot to Tony Williams then. But I couldn't, you know, Tony's playing was so new 
and unlike anything before that, that it was hard to, to figure out visually how, what he was doing, you know what I mean? It was, and um, I got a new set of drums. I got a 18 inch bass drum I bought and, um, and uh, you know, small toms and snare drum and brought them in and Chick, we went to the club that one afternoon, Chick sort of sat down and started playing the drums. And I saw him play and it sort of, it, it was a whole different approach to playing. It was more, it was a lot freer and, and he was a Tony freak too. So he loved a lot of that stuff. And it was like, it opened up a whole new door for me to, to start, it, it helped me make sense out of what I heard Tony do that I couldn't figure out what he was doing. And, um, and so that really overnight changed my plan. During my last year of college, Vietnam was still going on. And uh, so I had to, I, John Beck, who's my teacher, uh, had been my teacher for years, uh, you know, helped me get auditions for different service bands in the Washington area. And Tony Levin, went to New York. We both graduated at the same time. Uh, this is an important part of my career because Tony spent three years in New York while I was in the Army in Fort Meade. And when I got out of, of the Army, uh, you know, eventually I went to New York and lived with Tony and, and his wife then. And he introduced me to people that he had, that he had uh, been working with. It was a dream come true. I was getting a chance to um, to play with people that I looked up to, you know what I mean? So it was, it was great. I, I loved it and, you know, like to be able to play in studios with great players and, uh, and be able to hear what you did back. I mean, it was a, a great learning opportunity for me to be able to, you know, weed out my playing, you know, you start to learn how to, what works and what doesn't work uh, in the studio. Certain things work live when you've got a live audience there and and, uh, and people can see what you're doing. But, you know, when it's just the audio, then sometimes you've got to like simplify the stuff to make it sound the best that it can sound musically. So it was a tremendous learning experience for me. I was meeting new players you know, getting to know artists that I looked up to, it was, uh, it was fantastic. And then Paul Simon called, you know, or, or someone representing Paul Simon called me to uh, do a session. And the first, first session I did with Paul was at A&R 799, 799 7th Avenue was a real big uh, room. And Phil Ramon was producing and it was, um, have a Good Time was the song. I don't know what the order of other songs were, but 50 Ways was uh, on that same album, I guess, and we did that at a and 48th Street. Back then you'd do, you know, one artist one day, one artist another day. I mean, they weren't really blocking weeks of time to, to do sessions then. It was like 10 to one, two to five, you know, that, that kind of thing. A lot of times you, you didn't have time to go in and listen to playback, if it was a jingle, if they weren't listening for the whole track, if they were just looking, listening for something in particular, they didn't need everyone to come in and listen. I would stay in the, the drum booth and just practice different things. And at the time I was practicing, you know, doing things with uh, hitting the left hand, hitting the left foot, and then hitting the left hand on the cymbal right after it. So. I was constantly looking for, you know, new things to do. You know, new patterns. Um, just different things to do. And so I was doing this when we were doing uh, 50 Ways. Part of the song was all together, but uh, the beginning of the song just wasn't feeling right. And Phil heard me practicing and said, well, you know, why don't you try doing something like that, like a military thing. That's how a lot of things, how a lot of music happened on recordings where it was like a group effort 
you know, with the producer, the artist, me trying different things. And um, it wasn't like me trying to go where I had a sound, my sound in mind. I mean, my, my sound was like whatever I heard that I liked, you know? And, and I would try to make that work for the music. When I first started doing sessions, like they had drums in the studio. You, I only took a trap case. So the toms were all, in the bass drum were already there. And sometimes the toms were so used that it was hard to tune them. I, had to, I used to smoke back then and I used to have to take a, a cigarette and roll it over the dents to the, the heat of the cigarette would tighten up the plastic so you could read, so you could start getting a tone out of them. And uh, you would do that and get this, the drums to sound the best that they could sound for that room, for those heads. And, um, and so you, you just, that's what we did. It wasn't like, like I had this thing in mind, you know, I, I didn't. And in those years, I was going back and forth from New York to LA doing sessions. And so if, if well, when I was in LA, if someone heard that I was there, then sometimes I would get called to do a session for someone that didn't hire me to fly out there, but while I was there would use me. So this is the way that Asia happened. I was out there, I don't remember what I was doing, but I got a call for, I, uh, I think through Gary Katz, who was producing Steely Dan at the time. What I had heard was, that they had been trying to do this track with different people and, you know, had it, but weren't sure if that's what, if they had what they really wanted, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I mean, they're, they're a pop band, so Asia was a little bit weird for, I mean, that was a, a stretch for, for that kind of playing on a pop thing, you know what I mean? I think it was hard for people, for them to communicate to a drummer exactly how far they wanted them to go. The music was there, um, and uh, and I was a good reader. And what we were able to get through this thing, and um, the first time. And I, I, but I don't think they took the first one because I think that they wanted me to play more at the end, which was, sort of weird for for that for that a kind of pop date no one would ever ask that but so you know so i did and surprisingly that's what they wanted it was more kind of crazy busy energetic kind of um uh playing that would you know draw attention to to the drums rather than to not do that and at the time i didn't know who was going to overdub on it, um, that it was going to be Wayne Shorter. But I didn't really get to know Wayne that well. I wish I had. Um, but I didn't really get to, get to know anyone that well back in those years. I was pretty wasted. Chris Parker was is, also played with stuff. and. They were playing at McKell's and, and I, at the time, I was living in Woodstock and coming into New York and staying in town like three or four nights a week. And I told Chris, he, who was doing a lot of dates at that time, I would love to, you know, sub for him. So I started out subbing for Chris with stuff. It was such a great opportunity for me to play with um, Richard T and, and Gordon Edwards, Cornell Dupree. And, and um, Eric Gale. I had so much respect for these guys and have that, that re I still, I mean, I have respect for these guys and for what they do that I wanted to be able to take it somewhere where I could lift these guys up like they lifted me up. And, um, and we just, you know, we certainly weren't doing it for money. We just went up to the club and and played every night. These were guys that we did sessions with during the day. 
And then it was just fun to go up and play at this club at night. And it, little by little, it got tighter and tighter. And, you know, we started playing songs that other people had done, but putting our own spin on it. And uh, it was great. It was magic. And it was, uh, the groove was as strong as I'd ever heard it in anything I'd ever done. And, and not only did it feel good when we were doing it, but it was, it was communicated to the audience. So it, it got spiritual. Everyone felt that kind of, it just, it was, it would make you want to uh, stand up and shout. You know what I mean? It was just that, that exciting and that kind of, uh, uh, it just moved you. You hit your soul. When you develop relationships with artists, it's it's not just about the playing. It's, I mean, playing-wise, I would always give all that I have, you know, creatively, um, energy-wise, um, you know, trying to understand what people verbally want you to do musically, how they're trying, you know what I mean? Just do whatever it takes to, to try and get there. And, but then it's like, what, you know, what you bring to the table in terms of keep trying to keep the morale of either the session or the, uh, or the tour. You know, if you're out on the road, you know, and things get rough, you can really, if you start complaining or saying the wrong thing, you can, you can poison the well, you know what I mean? And it's not, that's not a good idea. Uh, and, and if you, if that starts to happen, you've got to be able to try to try to you know put out that fire without making a problem with somebody. Just sort of make everyone remind everyone what what we're there for. 